once again, thank you for inviting me and my wife. Um, I, as I was telling some of the audience, I'm extremely happy and honored to be here uh, in this country. I enjoy it a lot. Um, I think it has a lot of similarity to where I spent my teenage years, uh, Canada. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's, let me get into my topic today. Now, um, I'm speaking of war and refugee movement. Uh, again, it's not a happy topic, but uh, as Julie says, um, so the things I'm talking about today um, are actually from, you know, my research on this book, right? But, you know, when you do research on this topic for 10 years, it's not, you know, you're writing a book at the end um, that you cannot put everything in it. So what I'm talking about here about uh, the Civil War exiles and refugees in Hong Kong in Southeast Asia and also on these little islands uh, in the uh, sort of coastal areas of China, of Zhejiang, during uh, the 1950s. It's actually part of this research, right? It's just the stuff that I actually didn't have space to put in the book, so I'm happy that I have a chance to talk about it. Uh, and these are the, the books. Uh, it's just the Chinese version and the original English version was published in 2021. It's the Great Exodus from China. Now, um, in so generally, you know, when you talk about the scholarship, um, there's a lot of uh, research uh, in the past 20 years, um, actually from the perspective of China. So um, this idea of studying war and displacement in the first half of the 20th century, it's sort of a, in, in East Asia, especially China, you know, Japan and this country around it, actually arrived from this sort of need to study like World War II in Asia. So um, it, there's been a lot, there's a rich scholarship, Anglophone scholarship, uh, mostly from China's perspective with regard to the social history of war and refugee experiences. So, um, I, mean, I mean, if you're, you sort of have read into the subject, you probably have read these books, Stephen McKinnon, uh, Keith Chopa, Ron Emitter, and Hans van der Ven. So anyway, but curiously, there's really not a lot about um, the Chinese Civil War itself, uh, and also what's happening during the Cold War. Well, we all know that in 1949, <coughs> uh, Chinese Communist Party came to power in China and sort of built the current regime, right? Uh, and then, so there is a study of the Chinese Civil War, but what I'm arguing is that by, by comparison, research on refugees and social displacement caused by the Chinese Civil War in Cold War in Asia, is inadequate, and there are three very simple reasons. The first reason is that you have this contested historiography of the Civil War because you have two Chinas uh, during the Cold War, and both of them were trying to basically sort of tell their side of the story, right? Um, and for example, in China, it's called the War of Liberation. If you talk to any of the historians of modern China uh, to study this war, so, so simply put, <laughs> The Chinese Communist government nowadays will happily open their archives and provide foreign scholars like, you know, um, historians like Rana Midur, Hans van der Van with documents to study the, the resistance war, right? Because it's about putting China up there with the rest of the, oh, China being the upholder of the post-war like order. Uh, and China being part of the victor nations. It is, you know, just give us uh, the idea that China's international status nowadays. But let's not forget China is not a democratic country with, you know, because any access of, to the research you wouldn't do in China, it's gonna be regulated by the government, right? And so when it comes to civil war, the Chinese narrative is the war liberation. There are certain things you can and cannot write about, right? And this is why and also in Taiwan used to be this way, uh, you know, the Chinese nationalist version of that history, right? But because Taiwan became a democracy in the 1990s, right, and the, the arch archives right now is actually quite open. It's just that to my amazement when I did this research, right, not a lot of people is really looking into this topic, the Civil War, because, you know, during the Civil War, you do have one million people displaced from China to Taiwan. And later on, as I show in this talk, uh, to other parts of Asia as well. And these stories are really not told. And so part of the reason is because, you know, when you look at also, you know, not only the, 
the, the historiography of the sort of the tension between two China influencing this historiography. But the Western scholars themselves, especially Anglophone scholars, um, they got in to study the Chinese Civil War mostly as a revolution. So when I said, you know, there are really not a lot of, you know, studies that actually focus on the social history of war or uh, displacement and subjects of refugees, some of you here, you know, are, who are familiar with this historiography might say, no, I read a book about Mao's revolution. I read, yes, you know, you, you can see that those books is structure. you know, the question that those, those books ask is, you know, basically study this history as a revolution, as a socialist revolution. So the most important question is, why did the CCP win and the nationalists lost, right? And the, the, the explanation is usually, well, they got the support of the peasants. How did they get the support of the peasants? Oh, you have all these complexities. Yes, but in, so you have like more than three or four dozens of books or hundreds of articles that are written about the so-called Chinese Communist Revolution. But, you know, a, a lot of them talked about the war. So the war is sort of in the background, right? What we don't see in this is, you know, millions of people being displaced and killed. And so when this Japanese resistance, it, you know, it's resistance to Japanese invasion, it's, it's easier to talk about the suffering and the casualties caused by the Japanese, but it's a lot harder, you know, for the Chinese themselves to talk about killing one another. And, and very, very, very strangely, it's also kind of because when you, a Western scholar, you study Chinese, you read the Chinese sources, but, but in a sense, you're actually also influenced by you know whatever that's written right so um and also i th i think the third reason is about you know because if you look at you know the city of refugees you know especially in world war ii uh the formation of the united nations especially the unhcr the high commissions for refugees if you look, look at that body right and this is i think a lot of people know this right this is undisputable that the post-world war ii international refugee bureaucracy and relief efforts put a lot more emphasis, like in the, especially in the 50s and 60s on Europe and the Middle East. The Middle East is because of, you know, you have the relocation of the Jewish population over there and you have the, the question of Palestine and, it, and it is an Israel problem, right? So that's why you have, but the, the consequences of that is that you have the focus over there in terms of the, like I'm gonna show you, uh, when we talked about Hong Kong refugees. I have to move a little bit quickly. So this is, you know, sort of for the Taiwan Spotlight Program. Um, and the main argument, the centrality of the point that I want to sort of make in this talk is the centrality of Taiwan in telling the various post-war, War II, Cold War refugee experiences. Now, I call this um, the transnationality or transnationalism during the Cold War. Now transnationalism, I know it's a big term, the way in which we use it, it's for globalization, right? Uh, we have, we're living in a world where the world is connected through trade, through internet, uh, through people traveling, like we're traveling here to get this, you know, give you this lecture, right? Um, and, but there are, you know, different times in the world where traveling is sort of restricted, right? And there are people who, you know, they travel or they move from one place to the another, you know, not because they want to, like what we're doing now. It's because, you know, they're the sort of displaced, right? So what I'm trying to argue is that, you know, there is something called Cold War transnationality or Cold War transnationalism that is very different uh, from the transnationalism that we know today. And so it has several of these features, right? First of all, the ideological conflict and the political use of refugees. So as you will see in the examples, I'm gonna give you very briefly, Hong Kong, um, Dachan Island, and Burma, you know, in almost all of these cases where uh, people actually displace uh, during the civil war from China to, to in these areas, right? Uh, there are actually used by different political forces, uh, used mostly by the nationalist government in Taiwan, but behind that is the United States, right? They're fighting a Cold War against the Soviet Union and communist China, and so it's called people voting with their feet. The idea that you have all these refugees coming out of a particular country, especially a communist country, that's kind of like, hey, you know, they legitimize that regime, right? If you have more of these people coming out, that means, you know, 
the capitalist world is a lot better than the communist world. So, um, and of course, the, uh, the communist regimes themselves will try to basically politicize uh, these displacements as well by trying to come up with a counter-argument. Why are these people going to Hong Kong? Why are these people in Burma? Uh, and why are all these people at the, uh, the coastal Zhejiang while they are? Because, you know what, they're not refugees. These are like nationalist pirates, and they're sponsored by the CIA, you know, those kind of things. But as you will see, there are a certain degree of truths in all these competing discourses. What I'm trying to say is that the ideological conflict itself play a big part in the political use of these refugees. And so during the Cold War, although there's UNSCR, you will find that refugee relief itself, it becomes extremely politicized. And also that because these people were actually displaced by the war, their own subjectivities and agency was sort of suppressed. So their story not important at all. Their experience is not important at all. It's for these powerful political regimes to use these people, right? And, and basically just displace them once again in the process, as I will show in some of the examples. Uh, borders and restrictions, number two, of course, um, uh, because you can't really go someplace out, you know, like, you know, just to move freely, right? And when you sort of cross that iron curtain into the free world, you cross that because some of these regimes sort of like, as we'll see in the case of the Dachan Islands, it's kind of like, you have to move to Taiwan. There's no choice for you not to move. Uh, if you say you want to stay, that means you want to be communist. That's really bad. So mm -hmm. 28,000 people actually move and the US 7th Fleet, the entire 7th Fleet actually went from Japan to the southern coast of China to help Chiang Kai-shek's government remove those mm -hmm. people, the 28,000 fishermen and their family living in coastal Georgia on these islands when the Nationalist Army decided to pull out the, those islands in, in early 1955, right? And so, um, so of course, you know, these are these people's experience. Naturally, there will be a lot of trauma, uh, displacement, and nostalgia. And of course, when these community, uh, they get to Taiwan, or they were stranded in Hong Kong, or they were stranded in northern Burma, and they, you know, it, you have all kinds of funny situations. The people, like these certain people in Hong Kong, certain people in North Burma, they really wanted to get to Taiwan, but the government in Taiwan said, no, uh, we needed to stay put in these regions because you're useful to us uh, to show that the People's Republic China is actually producing this refugee. And although you want to come, we will not let you come. We will try to, to, to let you become a perpetual refuge. So you have all these like strange situations, right? But when you have population on the ground, and these are experiences that they live through, there will be these, these sort of sentiments, right? And they'll miss their home, so they want to go somewhere they could not go. And that's why I mean when I say borders and restrictions. And of course, number four, vastly differentiated relationship with the international bureaucracy and the NGO governing and assisting refugees. Because you, you, you sort of see, um, I need to talk about this a little bit quicker. So let's move straight to Hong Kong then because I'm talking about general examples. You go to Hong Kong, you, you immediately understand what I'm talking about. Um, the tiny British government calling the Hong Kong was because of the Chinese Civil War. It was like a big refugee camp in the 1940s and 50s where we're talking about one million people just enter. Um, and the British position on these refugees, and this comes straight from the Governor General at the time, Sir Alexander Grant. He said that we need to prevent more people from coming because if you, uh, it's not a good idea to help these people, right? Because if you do, then Hong Kong will become, a, in his word, a glorified soup kitchen for the Chinese refugees. There are so many war and displacement in China. There's so many we cannot take care of. And the Hong Kong, then you have the nationalist government in Taiwan who try to basically take this issue to the United Nations and make it look bad on a communist. And the communists themselves trying to say that the Hong Kong government abused these refugees by not taking of them, by not taking care of it. And the United States is actually behind uh, all of this and try to use some of the refugees in Hong Kong to do espionage in China. So the United States want these people to, to stay put, you see, who can become ref I mean, I guess for everyone it's like refugees because you are displaced by war. You lost your possessions, you're forced to move, and you're traumatized. So it seems that the international community had this obligation to help you. But in actual practices, and I always say that to a certain degree still today, 
who can become refugees because they have this mission, the UNHR mission into Hong Kong to 1954-1955 uh, to determine whether these people, the Chinese, because the UNHCR help all these white refugees, the white Russians, the Jewish population coming out of China and they help them. But there are only a, you know hundreds of thousands of them. Well, what about this one million or so Chinese refugees? So there's this tug of war in international politics. And then, you know, at the, you know, so, so the UN actually sent a mission, the UNHCR sent a mission, right? And in the end, at the end of this mission, the head of the mission actually couldn't say, <laughs> he wanted to say we have a refugee problem because, but the British didn't want him to say it. The United States didn't want him to say it. So he, uh, in the end, he had to publish this entire report. It was published in, in Belgium, I, I think. Uh, it, it, was, it was sort of an unofficial report saying that, yeah, we do have this refugee problem, but you can't call it refugee. You have to call it a problem of people. <laughs> That's, and, and so, I, I mean, you know, so, so if you want to understand the Hong Kong situation, there's a very good article by my former supervisor at, uh, at University of British Columbia. It, it says, it, I put it here, Glenn Peterson, to be or not to be the refugee. That's a, that's a question, right? It is a straightforward question for the rest of us, but you know, when it comes to international politics, especially core politics, the political use of refugees, it's not a very straightforward question. Now, let me give you another example, because you know, I have three minutes left, and I still have a lot of ground to cover. Now, so again, like I, I, you know, so I wrote an article about this, uh, this particular refugee community in Hong Kong, also in you know, it's it's called the Ready Smell Refuge. Again, I do not have a lot of time to go into it, but if that ever comes up in a in a Q and A, uh, long story short is that this particular group of refugees, they're former national soldiers and their families. The thing is, is that they most of them wanted to go to Taiwan, but a lot of them didn't. Was not were not accepted into Taiwan because the nationals want these people to stay there intentionally in order to sort of build a basis. And these people, like, they really wanted to go to Taiwan. Uh, so um, anyway, we're going to skip over because I don't have time to talk about the history of this particular community, you know, you know it's, its evolution in Hong Kong. Um, anyway, I'm going to skip forward. I, of course, this entire, it developed into this, in, this community, uh, but it was demolished uh, in 1996. Because in 1997, uh, Hong Kong reverted back to the rule of the PRC, and the Hong Kong government, and also the PRC government, cannot allow a community like this, that has this deep historical connection to Taiwan, to continue to exist. Now, um, I'm going to sort of uh, talk about Dachan people just a little bit, two minutes left. And probably we won't have time to talk about North Burma, but again, if that ever comes up in the q and I, I can talk more. So who are these, what we call the Dachan, you know, islanders and, and refugees? Um, again, one of the things I, that amazes me when I do this research is that I read so, so many works on the Taiwan Strait crisis in 1954-55, because that's kind of like the Cuban Missile Crisis in the Cold War, where the entire world almost end with, because the United States, one of the options is for the U.S. government is to use the nuclear bomb in time. And this was in, in 1954-55, earlier than the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, um, because the United States was seriously consider using atom bomb to really stop the communist advance on Taiwan. But in the midst of this crisis, right, and I said that there are 20,000 fishermen and their families in this coastal area of central Zhejiang that was actually displaced. Um, you can look up, you know, works on the Taiwan crisis. It's always about diplomacy, international politics, and everything. That's, there's not one single book, an article about these people who were displaced. Their experiences, you know, how they think about themselves, and when they got to Taiwan, how they were helped or not helped by the United States and by the nationalist government and how they come to define themselves as a community. I find all of this history to be extremely fascinating and very important uh, to, to in our understanding of the relationship between China and Taiwan uh, today. Uh, but like I said, you know, it's, it's really, really not studied. Um, I think you know, I have 10 seconds left if, if, if you allow me for another minute or two to finish. Now, 
The nationals lauded these evacuees from Zhejiang as the righteous compatriots. Um, their motto, anti-communist escapee, who would rather burn their homes and boats and depart with the nationals instead of staying behind and allow themselves to be enslaved uh, by the Chinese communists. That's the language, right? Um, that you read about uh, when you sort of, but in reality, many were forced to leave and destroy their own properties. And so, and also that, you know, on the day of the evacuation, um, the entire US 7th Fleet, um, it's, you know, went to, this is like impressive. Basically, seven carrier groups, 300 ships went over there to make sure because first of all, United States didn't want to see another Korean War at this point. Uh, and second of all, they want to make sure, they promised Chiang Kai-shek that they will sort of evacuate everyone. Because Chiang Kai-shek said, uh, you know, if I'm going to lose this territory once again to the communists, I need to make sure that I get the people. So, you know, it, that will be a moral history, a victory for my regime, right? So having this moral victory and having this propaganda, the political use of refugee is much more important than the actual livelihood and, 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 and the, the willingness of these people to move, right? Um, and so I think, and, and if, you, if you read in the English reportage, just some, um, you know, because this is a major event, uh, again, very little about who these people actually think of who they are, um, and but you know this is reported in the Western media as a humanitarian rescue mission, uh, which I think it's sort of questionable in a way. If you, again, like I have two articles coming out about these people's experiences, including how they were not, you know, sort of left for to fend for themselves when their relief effort failed in Taiwan. Later on, how some of them find their way to the United States and become sort of part of. Uh, the Taiwanese diaspora in the United States, but different from other Taiwanese. Mm. So I'm going to stop there because, you know, I, I, I sort of hope we have more sort of time to interact with the audience. So uh, thank you very much. That'll be the end of my talk.